all good morning. Um, and welcome to our last great collaboration of the semester. We are delighted to have all of you here this morning. Uh, and thank you very much for your support. As uh, Ivan mentioned, we are really looking forward to uh, plan our next years for next year. And also, uh, any support that you can uh, provide will be really appreciated. Uh, we've been creating a program that has made tremendous impact and has been reaching to many people in the community that normally would not come here on a Saturday morning, so we really appreciate your presence here. And I, I want to thank a few people, and, and, and first and foremost, the hard work for our team, Yvonne Irving, uh, Heather Gray, Alex Richardley, and Lisa Langdon, and our student workers, Joseph Garcia, Sebastian Campos, Tibisay Alvarez, Renier Ballesteros, Ariel Tini, and Annabel Galindo. They make everything that campus is doing possible, and I'm extremely, extremely grateful to the hard work and dedication to these events and other programs we have on campus. I want to also give special thanks to Catherine Ortiz and Chris Schaefer from the UA Bookstore for hosting us here um, monthly. And of course, special thanks to the mastermind behind the collaborations, Regis Professor Paula Fan, who by now needs no introduction, but who must be acknowledged as the creative soul of the series. Paula's many accomplishments pale in comparison to her passion for bringing new ideas and people together in interesting and sometimes challenging ways. I also want to welcome and thank Dr. Susan Crane, who is Associate Professor of Modern European History here at the U of A. Her research focuses on thematic issues of collective memory, historical consciousness, and the uses of photography as historical evidence, particularly in modern German history. She is the author of Collecting and Historical, Conscious Col His historical Consciousness in Early 19th Century Germany, as well as several publications on the nature of atrocity photography and the memory of the Holocaust. She has uh, been teaching a course on the Holocaust in history and memory since 1993, and will offer this course in the Humanities Seminar in the fall of 2015. And with that, I just want to ask uh, Paula Fan to please take this event away, and um, we we'll look forward to the great program. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Dr. Crane, and thank you all. I came to this question in two ways. And the first was many years ago when I performed a cycle to poems of children of Teretzin. And this was the first way. I'll talk about the second way somewhat later. I only sleep today that I wake up. 
introduced beautifully uh, to tell us about this very special and sinister place called Terezin or Theresienstadt. So, as some of you I'm sure already know, uh, this is, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> As uh, some of you, I'm sure, already know, and I hope not from personal experience, but it's entirely possible, uh, the ghetto or transit camp that we know today as Theresienstadt in the German, or Terezin in the Czech for the town in which it was located, was set up to participate in the Nazi genocide known as the Holocaust in 1941. So when we talk about this as a unique place, we're talking about it as a particular location in a process that spanned 1933 to 1945 and beyond and took the lives of over six million people. But what was unusual about Theresienstadt, and I hope I'm not offending anyone if I continue to call it by the German name, but since we're talking about the Holocaust, this is the language that they used. Uh, Theresienstadt was set up temporarily early on in a destruction process that did not yet have its final solution. So it was a temporary place to house Jews in particular, also so-called Mischlinge, people of mixed race that the Nazis in the Third Reich had designated as people of mixed race that they did not want to continue to live in their society. So it's a temporary holding place for Czechs, and Germans who happen to be Jewish or people of mixed racial heritage. And that's its initial uh, creation. It's set up this way in 1941. Now I see why. Now I can have the mic. Okay. It's set up this way in 1941. Apologies. It comes to have a slightly different purpose afterwards. So by 1942, it has become a ghetto. Ghettos have been set up by the Nazis starting in 1939, immediately following the um, onslaught against Poland. So as soon as the war began, they started rounding up uh, Jews and putting them into designated areas in large towns and small villages. These are walled off sections of a town where only Jews are allowed to live, and a lot of people die right there because the conditions in the ghettos are horrific. They are not set up um, with adequate housing. They are not set up with adequate sanitation food, medicine, any of that. So you could say from the beginning of the war, the Nazis only had ever one purpose for their victims, and that was to kill them. The question simply was, is it going to happen sooner, or is it going to happen later? So the ghettos have been horrible already for a couple of years before the one in Theresienstadt was created. And this is where Theresienstadt becomes a little bit unusual. Should I go into detail now? Yeah. Okay. Theresienstadt um, was actually set up as a family camp. Children were not always separated from their parents. Um, although there are also purpose-built orphanages or children's homes, that they call them, um, where they felt that they could look after the children better collectively. So Jews setting up and organizing uh, social welfare for their own people. Um, so about half the children end up living in these children homes, children's homes, and about half the children end up living with one parent in sex-segregated barracks. The conditions in the barracks are still awful, but, and this is where the choiceless choice theme that we're going to get into later uh, comes up, um, they're really awful if you compare them to Warsaw at the same time, or if you compare them to Lodz. But to, for Theresienstadt to have, for instance, well, roofs over their heads and daily food provided in central kitchens, this was considered somewhat better. The survivor Ruth Kluger remembers uh, people later telling her, Oh, you were at Theresienstadt? Oh, well, that wasn't so bad. This to a woman who also survived Auschwitz. They would say, well, you know, Theresienstadt wasn't so bad. And she said, basically to the reader, she says, what planet are these people coming from? But she's too polite to correct the German woman uh, who is telling her this because she knows the woman is clearly clueless. She's incomprehensible. She's not going to understand what Theresienstadt really was like. It is overcrowded. There isn't enough food. People are always hungry. But again, in comparison to Warsaw, where people are starving, it's relative suffering, some people will say. The other thing about Theresienstadt is that the Nazis used it as temporary housing for so-called prominent Jews, or elite Jews. People that individual Nazis back in the Third Reich, for one reason or another, had a sense of wanting to protect for personal reasons, because they knew them or had a connection to them. And in particular, elderly Jewish citizens, former citizens of Germany. 
So there are a lot of elderly residents in Theresienstadt between 1942 and 1944, and this is also the period when the deportations to extermination camps began. And yet at the same time, for the year mostly of 1943 to 1944, um, the Nazis put an effort into, they temporarily halted the deportations from this camp, and they put some efforts into beautification. And what this meant was some gardens, what this meant was a Red Cross visit in uh, the summer of 1944 to show the world how humanely the Nazis were treating their subhuman uh, fellow, former fellow citizens. So Theresienstadt has this odd history of, on the one hand, being a horrific element of a horrific destruction process, and at the same time, having this kind of odd lull, this odd period, where, again, survivors like Ruth Kluger actually remember some solidarity among children, among the victims, who are actually able to get a little bit of education, maybe, or actually able to take art classes, and this is why, oh, we don't have them up yet. This is why you'll see some of the art um, that accompanies the, the musical performance. Uh, some of that was created and saved from this period, when there were actually teachers trying to look at, teachers were voluntarily trying to look after some of the children in Theresienstadt. This is just unheard of in any of the other, in any camps. Uh, there are efforts in other ghettos to try and retain a sense of cultural life, of Jewish identity, um, of a religious identity, of attending services or having rabbis trying to instruct children. So this is Theresienstadt. It is hor horrific, it is unusual, it is unique, and in the end, it's, as far as the Nazis are concerned, just one more step on the way to a final solution in which all of its inmates were supposed to be killed. Besides the art, some of you who were here earlier might have seen a loop of the art that was created in Teretzin. There were poems, and these poems were written on scraps of paper, on the backs of forms, and children tell it as they see it. details of everyday life. If you look at these pictures, you will see pictures of the so-called parks and uh, the buildings and daily life 
what I found very moving, and this, of course, is the title of the group of poems and pictures that you will find in this volume, I Never Saw Another Butterfly, was the fact that children also saw other things. The, one of the art teachers in Teretzin, uh, Friedel Dika um, Brandeis, um, smuggled in a number of art supplies and taught art in secret. And um, two of her, the children who survived, mentioned that she had them see beyond what was around them. And so therefore, if you examine some of these paintings, you will see flowers, you will see butterflies, you will see nature, you will see signposts of Teretzin in one place and elsewhere as another place. And so what you find ultimately in some of these pictures is a sense of imagination and a sense of memory, perhaps, that maybe was encouraged by the art teacher who, with 60 of her uh, pupils, was deported to Auschwitz. Um, but you see something beyond the gray.
talking to them. Yeah, so after the beauty of those poems and of the music, um, it's always a bit of a hard crash to come back to the reality of what was going on uh, at the camp. So yes and no, they knew and they didn't. Um, and it depends on when you ask. Um, uh, two things that strike me thinking about the poems and in response to what Paul is asking. Um, we always think of children as innocent um, because of their youth, um, because of how sweet they are, and I'm speaking here as a mother. Um, and at the same time, their innocence was compounded in uh, Theresienstadt because they were innocent victims. They had done nothing wrong, and yet they were being persecuted in this way. Um, it was senseless to them. Um, they knew there was a war on, and yet the war wasn't being fought right there anymore. So it wasn't a question of daily survival of combat or bombs that was a, a, an issue for them. So when you ask, did they know what was coming? Um, in 1941, they didn't, because neither did the Nazis. The extermination camps didn't exist yet. Um, at the same time, however, on the Eastern Front in the summer of 1941, after the Nazis had invaded Russia, they had extended a vast um, front line of extermination following behind the front line of combat. So people being gunned down on a daily basis, taken out of their homes, shot. Uh, those people's holocaust lasted a day, really. Uh, they had no idea what was coming. These were Jewish victims being rounded up simply because they were Jews, men, women, and children, and shot right there outside their villages. That's in 1941, and that's uh, in the aftermath of that uh, slaughter. That's when Theresienstadt uh, is created. So did they know then what was coming? In a sense, no. Um, did they know a year later? Absolutely, because the five purpose-built extermination centers, Auschwitz, um, Birkenau being the biggest and most infamous, uh, Treblinka, Majdanek, Sobibor, Belzec, and Chelmno. Uh, these were all um, starting to uh, be lethally effective in late fall, early winter of 1942. So when deportations started happening from Theresienstadt, the victims were only told that they were being sent east, and in some cases that they were being sent to other ghettos like Minsk or Riga. Um, but these were obviously in places where the mass slaughter was already occurring outside of these ghettos, and that was what was intended for those ghetto inhabitants as well. So these people's disappearance created an atmosphere of fear and anxiety, of terror, uh, in Theresienstadt. Um, and then, yeah, they were hearing rumors and they were getting some glimpses into what was really coming. Um, but for most of them, uh, the deportations then stop, um, and then there's this kind of lull in the period of 1943, and there's guarded reason for optimism, um, which is then the rugs pulled right back out from under their feet when the deportations start again in 1944. So um, to the extent that anyone in um, occupied Europe knew what was coming, it also depended on where you were located. Uh, people in Poland knew a lot. Sorry, I can hear the mic. Doing that again. Does this help? I'm sorry. Um, people in occupied Poland obviously knew a lot more. Um, people around um, Theresienstadt perhaps less, unless they were traveling. So news was not supposed to travel fast when it came to the extermination camps. Could they have seen trains, trains that went out full and came back empty? Absolutely. Uh, did people's possessions get left behind? And this is where some of the art supplies also came from, unfortunately. Um, that also caused people to wonder what had happened. Sorry. OK. You can hear this OK? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. I'll turn it on. <laughs> I don't think this is better, but oh, it's better. Yeah.
So far we've heard the voices of children and we've talked about the paintings and the poems. Um, the role of music within the camps has been much discussed of late. This presentation was originally conceived to be complementary to a performance of the Quartet of the End of Time, for the End of Time, by Olivier Messiaen, who was incarcerated in a prisoner of war camp and who wrote this piece within the camp and, and actually premiered it there. Also, if any of you have watched the Academy Awards, you have heard the story of uh, a pianist, and she was billed as the world's oldest uh, Holocaust survivor. And she was in Terezin. There was a documentary done of her life, and it was called The Lady in Number Six. Her name was Alice Herzsoma. And she was a pianist and credited music for saving her life. She performed within the camp. But if you, re if you watch any squibs of her, and there are plenty on YouTube, you are struck by this amazing resilience and this amazing sense of the positive that uh, seems to just absolutely glow from her. Her name, once again, Alice Herzoma, the lady in number, number six. She just died about four weeks yeah. ago, was mm -hmm. it? In, in London at the age of 110. There were other artists who were incarcerated, not only in Terezin, but other places. One who was not so lucky was uh, pa uh, Paula Brown. And she was a pianist and a singer, and she performed in a number of the pre-war satirical cabarets that permeated Eastern Europe. Uh, and she was eventually herded up, herded into the Warsaw Ghetto. And there she wrote uh, poetry and performed, and eventually, and we're not sure of when she was deported uh, and eventually murdered. Uh, we would like to perform a work called The Jew, which was written in the Warsaw Ghetto, in which she uses the voice of a child.
mention there was a second reason that I came to this uh, question, project. Uh, oh, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I've always been told I'm loud, but uh, this, this may help. And this second reason is an incredible person to whom I was, with whom I was very close. His name is Herbert Zipper. And that posture is Herbert. He was a conductor, he was a student of Richard Strauss, he was a Viennese Jew, and he was eventually rounded up along with his brothers. He ended up in Dachau and Buchenwald. And there in Dachau, he first of all met uh, a poet that he had known before, and they wrote an anthem of defiance called Dachau Song. And he also founded a secret orchestra. Now, Herbert was educated. He also had been a cabaret artist, uh, as well as being a classical musician. But there he found, he, he found ways to make instruments. And actually, he found strings under his pillow that were probably the, uh, the, the gift, shall we say, of a sympathetic guard. And this orchestra met in the latrine and they performed in the latrine secretly for other prisoners. But Herbert told me, and I met him in China building orchestras, and he never told me at that time that he had survived the Holocaust. And I was absolutely uh, floored and charmed by his incredible positive attitude towards life and towards music. He would also uh, he would always meet with me and my husband, my late husband, and talk about how music was the good life. And little did we know until years later when a biography called Dachau Song was published about his life, about that other life that he had never mentioned. And when he would talk about it, he would talk about his arrival there and how he didn't know what was going to happen, how he was, uh, he was, uh, partook in forced, forced labor, he was, you know, it was forced labor, he was moving stones. And the thing he said kept him going was reciting poetry in his head. He said that he felt that there must have been, there had to be something that would keep him human, keep him human over and over and over again until he found another way. Uh, Herbert was, uh, had, shall we say, had a way of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But in this particular case, he was able to get out before the final solution. But he got out to, uh, to uh, Manila, where he was conductor of the Manila Symphony, um, and just in time to welcome the Japanese invasion. And he ended up in yet another camp at that particular time. Uh, from there, he went to the United States. He brought Off Schulberg with him to the United States, a, a form of musical learning. He founded and conducted the Brooklyn Symphony Orchestra. He founded the North Shore uh, Center for Musical Arts and eventually ended up in L.A. Uh, and it was from L.A. where he founded the Colburn School, which is Conservatory of Music, that he went to China, where I met him. And this... Uh, and he would continue to go to China, and once again, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, he was there down the street during the Tiananmen Square <laughs> uprising. So Herbert had a rather exciting life. But he said, once again, it was the arts that kept him alive. Now, I had the opportunity earlier this week to meet with a group of Holocaust survivors and to talk about them. They were curious about me, what would bring me to such uh, a project. I mean, after all, I'm a classical pianist, and I play Bach, Beethoven, and all that other stuff, and uh, in my insular little world. But um, it was it, there was curiosity on both sides. But of course, I was curious too as to what would keep someone going in this sort of situation. And of course, they had examined the title, of uh, the subtitle of this program, "Choiceless Choice," and they made it very clear that there were no choices. However, there were some, some memories that really, of, of what they said, that really stick with me. First of all, when I told them about Herbert, who, by the way, was not in Terrazin in the special camp, but was in one of the real camps, was that they made the point that he was educated. 
and that he was not ripped as a child from a, an education. He had had a life before, beforehand. He had a different sort of experience and a sort of different richness on which to draw. However, some of the other things that these survivors talked to me about uh, made me think. Uh, one of them in particular said, I had no choice. All I could think of was survival. But then, of course, he thought of survival as opposed to giving in. There was another woman who told me of a tune that went through her head constantly, and she didn't know what it was. It was the Kol Nidre. Um, it, and, and another survivor told me about first hearing classical music and how it awakened something within her soul. So every memory, of course, is unique. And they felt that Herbert was the exception. But you will read of the transformative powers of music uh, in, in many cases. Uh, of course, the, um, the film about uh, Alice Hans Zoma, which is called The Lady in Number Six, there was a film made about Herbert called Never Give Up. And it, too, was nominated for an Academy Award. It didn't win, but it was nominated. Uh, and, and there were, uh, are another, a number of books called, play, there's some called Playing for Time. There are a number that detail the experiences of musicians within the camps who, have, who managed to find music as a, a, a way of, so, of finding solace and a way of, of survival. Um, I thought we would finally end up with um, a piece that is based on the diaries of Anne Frank, who, and Anne Frank, who has, she has become sort of our, our iconic poster child, shall we say, of the Holocaust. And I'm, I'm almost curious why do you think this has happened. Oh, Anne Frank. How many of you have read the diary of Anne Frank? Exactly. So when we say that, that her, uh, memory has become iconic of the Holocaust. Um, what's interesting to point out is that it became that way through a series of additions, right? Because first there was her father, who didn't like the way that Anne referred to her mother in the diary, and therefore edited quite a bit of the diary to remove uh, tension between <coughs> the teenager and the mother. Um, then it got edited or mediated through Hollywood, which is, how many of you have seen the film or the play at some point? Oh, okay, not as many. Um, so the play continues to be performed. It was performed here in Tucson just in the past year by high schools, um, by community colleges, by schools. Um, so the play and the film then also present a version of Anne and overall, and this is just in the English edition, if you like, I can say something more about the German. Uh, overall, in the English edition, there was, shall we say, a reduction of her Jewishness in favor of a universal humanitarian message. And this is the famous line that we all know, which is that Anne still believes that people are all really good at heart. Um, and if that's the message that you take away from this, then you return to the, the strength of childhood optimism and the kind of hopefulness that we'd all like to retain as, as people, I think. But we forget the diary ends when she's deported and murdered. Now, okay, she dies of disease in a camp, but how, did, how and why did she get sick? She was forced to be there. I consider that part um, to be murder. Um, so the diary ends before um, the physical trauma of the camps began for her. So it presents um, edited versions of her experience and we, we sympathize with the horror and the trauma of being isolated in an apartment with your family for days and we empathize with the performers who are repeating it for us in present day productions. Um, but we have actually, in remembering Anne, lost a chunk of the Holocaust. Um, so I think that accounts for part of the popularity of the book. Um, but the other part, though, honestly, the resonance of it, every 13-year-old, every one of us women who was once a 13-year-old knows Anne. Um, there's something about the way she writes that just speaks to the teenage experience um, in a way that has transcended generations. So I think that actually is a big part of its popularity as well.
14 years old. It seems to me that no one will be interested in what I write. And yet I have to write. Something is buried deep inside my soul.
she was me. Oh God. Dear Kitty. I don't want to be like Margot and Mother and Mrs. Von and all of the women who work all their lives and are forgotten. I'm afraid of the dark. I'm alone in the I see something buried deep inside my soul.
I hear the ever approaching thunder. I feel the suffering of people being torn apart. And yet, in spite of everything, I still. Young Lee, who are both doctoral candidates in the School of Music, my colleague Mike Keith from the School of Music, and Susan Crane. Uh, as we listen to these poems and the music and look at the pictures, we have to remember that these are uh, these are all that survive people whose names and faces are largely lost to us. Uh, in closing, I'd like. Uh, Javier Duran, my Confluence boss, I'd like to ask him to make some remarks on the relevance of this experience to all of us uh, as a lesson, not just a piece of history. Thank you. As we all think about and remember this sad chapter in the history of humankind, let me bring a different and yet parallel perspective that might speak to the universality of this moment. And I did quite a bit of work on a Mexican writer from the 20th century, Jose Revueltas, who experienced prison due to his beliefs early on in his life. And he was a socialist, very concerned with the persecuted and exploited people in the world especially during the war period, and he wrote extensively about uh, the situation of Jew, Jewish people in the Soviet Union for a number of reasons. Uh, and basically, his concern was about the acts of violence, constant acts of violence, sanctioned by the state all the time, and going not only in Europe, Asia, but also here in the United States. We did create uh, concentration camps for Japanese Americans, in this country as well. So, Roberto was always concerned about human rights and about the human condition. And he creates a character, his name is Jack Mendoza, and the short novel is called Kane's Motive. This is from 1957. And Jack talks about la sensación judía, the Jewish sensation or Jewish syndrome. And Jack, a Mexican American war veteran that comes back to this country and finds himself persecuted by being Mexican American defines this um, sensation as, quote, it is a way to call it because the Jews have always been the persecuted people of the world. Absolute persecution has always followed them. In that sense, you 
I, Marjorie, an Anglo character in the novel, we're all Jews. The blacks are Jews. To be a Jew is not to belong to a race or religion, but rather to have suffered in person the act of persecution, the hatred, the torture. That is never forgotten. That remains forever within you, and it places you in a condition that you did not have before. So for Revueltas, persecution, marginalization, and exclusion of all peoples marks a common denominator of the human condition. At a time when the atrocities of the Holocaust were just being made public to large audiences worldwide, Revueltas anticipates in parallels the issue to the situation of underrepresented people in the United States, which, as we can still see, continue to be under siege even in the 20, 21st century in a place like Arizona. And yet, history is possibility. As Brazilian educator Paulo Freire reminds us, I'm quoting, the future is something that is constantly taking place. This constant taking place means that the future only exists to the extent that we change the present. It is by changing the present that we build the future. Therefore, history is possibility, not determinism. We cannot do the past, but we can certainly build the future. Let us do that so that future generations of children don't have to grieve about the excesses of absolute power and absolute dehumanization. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.